Hi, Matt. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Doing great. How are you? Couldn't be better. Let me introduce you. I'm Robert Wright. You're Matthew Iglesias, journalist, prolific generator of takes, publisher of the Slow Boring Newsletter. That's not a judgment. It's the yeah. actual name of the newsletter, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but first, I want to talk about another branding issue. Um, if all goes according to plan, then by the time this is posted, which will be a little more than a week after we're taping it, the YouTube channel that this appears on will no longer be called bloggingheads.tv, a brand that is uh, 17 years old. Mm. Uh, I started Blogging Heads TV in 2005 with Mickey Kaus and Greg Dingle. Uh, rather, uh, it will be called Non-Zero. And by the way, that's the name that's of your the, brand. That's my brand. It's becoming, I guess, more so. That's the name of the newsletter I publish. Uh, I would I venture to say it's not a less inviting title than Slow Boring, but we can get into all this. Uh, and the uh, if people have been listening to this on the Right Show podcast feed uh, in the past, that will be called Non-Zero, or strictly speaking, if you're looking for it in an alphabetically arranged list, uh, Robert Wright's non-zero. So it'll be right before all those T podcasts that start with V. Now, um, I wanted to have you on. Well, I, I would I would be happy to have you on at any at any moment, Matt. But Let it's a trip down memory lane. It, in this case, it really is because I'm someone who remembers what a blog is. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> uh, and uh, and you remember what it's like to be a very early blogging head because yes. you were uh, the second non-Bob Mickey blogging head. Uh, the we Mickey and I, I guess did the first dozen or two with just the two of us. Then we started branching out. We our first guest was uh, Eric Umansky, who is now ProPublica, was in it slate. Mm -hmm. I think you were the next one. Wow. And, I don't think I even realized that. Well, I'll tell you, I just went back and looked at our first conversation. Yeah. And if people want to look at all the archives, the easiest way, you can search YouTube, but the easiest way is go to the bloggingheads.tv site, click archives, uh, scroll down to 2005. Ours is in January 2006. And first of all, let me say that uh, if you showed people this video and that video and asked them in which video I was older, they would get the, the answer right. Yeah. Uh, they would get that right. You know, they would have a harder time with you. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. You're, no, you're we've, timeless. we've aged. Timeless and ageless. We've aged. Um, but uh, these were primitive times technologically. Now, I don't know if you remember this. Are you drinking? Is that a Starbucks coffee you're drinking right now? No, it's a coffee from the coffee bar on well, S Street. Another sign, of how, spot. another sign of how things could have changed because I don't know if you remember, you probably won't remember this, but I... I had gotten in touch with you via your blog. Yes. Which was called something like Matthew Iglesias. You've always, you've always devoted a lot of resources to coming up with these alluring names. And um, I, uh, you know, invited you on, but first we had to figure out if there was a way to get your computer to record video because folks, laptops did not come with webcams. And you, and you probably don't remember this. We were in the Starbucks on DuPont Circle and I was down in DC for some reason. Yeah, I had a Sony webcam uh, about the size of a of a cinder block. Oh no, I remember it well. You were this was we were really. I mean, it was you, but it was pushing the limits of the technology because at that time you couldn't record a video call. Yeah, right. There were two separate videos recorded in a somewhat ham-fisted way. We were talking on the phone, right? I think to have the actual conversation and then kind of hacking right. it together ex post to make it seem like what we do now. Right. Which is have a video call and then to, just record to, it. To, right. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I still remember the morning after having my coffee and thinking, wait a second, you could do it this way. Because this was, there was no, uh, people didn't have broadband. Okay. They yep. had these dial up ISDN. You, but some people had a version of ISDN or even a little bit of, uh, you know, but by and large, you just couldn't, as you said, you couldn't do what we're doing there. now. So I still remember when I thought, wait a second, if you just recorded each video locally, somehow splice them together, and then Greg Dingle, his tech genius, uh, handle the rest. So I wanted to talk about uh, 
whatever you want to talk about, kind of, but but certainly how things have changed, maybe reminisce a little about the golden days of blogging. Yeah. Uh, which which this tapped into. Yes. Uh, blogging heads because there was this whole new species of journalists called bloggers. And they weren't on cable TV. No. They had ardent fans. No one knew what they looked like, uh, except maybe through photos. But so one thing this did was uh, show people what they looked like. I mean, a lot of your early blogger f- friends, Ezra Klein, Ross Douthat, and so on. Uh, Eli Lake, I don't know if he had a blog per se, but, uh, you yeah. know, they were Megan McArdle. Will Wilkinson, yeah. Will Wilkinson was an early one. Uh, I think maybe you recommended Will. The uh, I, 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 there are so many names, and since some of them are going to come and have conversations like the one uh, y- you're having now, but um, I don't know, man. What do you uh, what do you have to say about all this? I mean, you know, I've always been, I, I think, pretty cognizant of the fact that you know, media is a is important, and it's a realm of ideas, and the ideas are important, but it's also kind of a a business that rests on a technological substrate, uh, which itself is constantly changing. I mean, I have a lot of family members. My, my father's a, a screenwriter and a, and a novelist rather than a journalist. But my mom was a graphic designer and an art director at Newsweek uh, when I was a really little kid. And she lived through the digital transformation of desktop publishing, which completely deprecated her job skills. I mean, she was a very high-level person in analog graphic design. And there was this moment in the 90s that was, I think from a writer's perspective, was the golden age of media when desktop publishing software had cut out the costs of producing print publications, but the internet hadn't wrecked the... uh, ad model. Uh, But it was terrible for my mother uh, and for her colleagues because they were the people who got sort of automated away. Um, So I I sort of witnessed, you know, that changing technology, changing the business, the business model shifts, changing the content uh, really early. Um, I think you you wrote for Time or Newsweek uh, back in the day. I I, I was uh, never on staff at Time, but I was on the masthead as a contributor. So yeah, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, Semi, I, I wrote stuff, yeah. But I mean, you know, it, it created this different paradigm then where space in the magazine was incredibly valuable, right? I mean, the, oh, the, totally. uh, the, the ad revenue per page was really, really high, but also the number of pages they would print was limited by the number of ads they sold. And you yeah. didn't sell ads at marginal cost. You know, profit maximization was, the price was really high, so the quantity was limited. So then the quantity of editorial pages was limited. Right. And you would need to sort of fight to get in totally. the magazine if, if you wanted to. The per word rate was astronomical compared oh, you, to you, you, contemporary you, journalism. Um, I mean, what I got from time would still probably shock people, notwithstanding inflation and everything. I mean, I was in a kind of a bidding situation at the, at that point, but I got uh, $5 a word and I had a deal where if it was less than a thousand words, they would count it as a thousand. And some editor, not knowing that, assigned me like a 200 word piece or something. Right. <laughs> but, but, and, and, but, and they and, treated you like a king. Like, like they would say, if you're in Washington, they're like, oh, you're doing... Co- we're going to close this cover story. Would you like to fly up here? We'll put you in this great hotel. Or would you rather be driven from Washington? I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. And 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 I mean, you know, $5, I mean, to people who don't know, that's, forget inflation. That is much more in nominal terms than you could get today for, for writing. And so it, it it rewarded a certain kind of writer, right? Like the the way to succeed in that paradigm was that if you took if you used a lot of time and resources, could you make something that would outcompete what other people with access to a lot of time and resources right. could do to right. get in? Because if you were in, it was very lucrative, but it was hard to get in. The internet for text completely turned that on its head. And right. it has provided a really big advantage to people like me who can generate a lot of stuff that is good enough to be of interest to some people. But uh, honestly, like, you know, and I I say this not in false humility, but if you told me, like, Matt, slow down, like, just do one thing a week, it it might be a little bit better than my average column, but it wouldn't be a lot better. And I know journalists who do do that. If you give them more time, 
their work gets mm-hmm. way better. And yeah. mine, I, I'm somebody whose uh, marginal return curve flattens out pretty early, mm. which is great for the internet, but would have been terrible for print. And yeah. then we have these other changes, you know, what works on TikTok, what works on YouTube, what works in podcasts. And it, it it's always shifting. So there was this cohort of bloggers, right? People who were good, basically, at writing really fast, sort of emerged right. into a disrupted media landscape about 15 years ago now. Right. A.J. Liebling of The New Yorker long ago said, I write faster than everyone who writes better than me, and I write better than everyone who writes faster than me. I don't know. That's not exactly the point on the curve you're talking about being. <laughs> right. But, he, but it's that's not what unrelated. He thought, but there's, it's like, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Liebling point uh, is actually very low volume compared to digital yeah. media. Now, you should, I, I mean, yes, all, all do humility of yours aside, you are really extraordinary in the amount of uh, high you know, intellectual, intellectually high content you can generate. It's true that you don't polish this stuff the way we did in days of yore. Um, and, and you're right. It was like, it was like, okay, you know, we're comp- Time Magazine is competing with Newsly. So like the first sentence has to do a good job of, you know, g- getting the read the second sentence. And the second, I, I mean, it really was, uh, you know, uh, more of an exercise in craftsmanship than you generally see today. And I remember when I first started reading your blog, even after you moved to the Atlantic, which by the way, mm-hmm. I take full credit for, as you know, because yes. uh, I recommended you to James Bennett, but it's uh, really, it's nothing. It, it's just the kind of person I am. <laughs> the, uh, um, but, but reading your blog and it would have all these typos. I'm like, what is this? Is this journalism? <laughs> but, but it didn't matter. And you understood that. I mean, uh, you don't, you, you, you've gotten rid of the typos. I think, uh, you know, somewhere in that uh, basement full of uh, chained up interns you have that that keeps your newsletter coming out with such stunning frequency as somebody who focuses on cleaning up typos or something. But in the early days, it, it was like a new genre. Yeah, I will. And let's shout out to somebody noticed that today's newsletter was full of typos. And the reason <laughs> is Claire, my copy editor, is sick and was not able to copy edit. Yeah. And people, people who are newer to me got to see what the classic Iglesias experience looked like. Um, and, it, <laughs> and it looks terrible. Um, but yeah, I mean, what's interesting is... So, I mean, of course, now, you know, I, I have a professionalized operation. People are, people are paying me a healthy amount of money. So I do invest in the copy editing. But it's... So it's worth doing. I think it matters, but it doesn't matter that much, right? You can do it if your if your ideas are good and the frequency is there on the internet, even with a lot of problems. And the Atlantic, you know, at that time I worked there, it was around when you started blogging heads, I think 2006, 2007. Yeah. And it was an incredible culture clash because they were real pioneers in terms of going on the internet, hiring me, hiring Ross, hiring Andrew Sullivan, hiring Megan McArdle, people straight out of the, the blogosphere. Mm-hmm. But the print magazine was still very much a print magazine like from the late 20th century. Today, I think they've reached a, a greater point of integration. You know, mm-hmm. So the, the digital brand and the print brand are, are similar. But at that time, it was like two completely contrasting cultures and approaches living under one house. And, and the culture of the Atlantic was, you know, the good thing to do was to get a story in print. And I like, I couldn't do it. Like yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't hack it in, in print then because I hadn't, um, I hadn't learned the discipline in the right kind of way. And I was so prolific on the blogs, but it was so different. I mean, a mo- we were talking about time, like a weekly, but a monthly magazine oh, yeah. was like, you know, that was for, that was for real artists. You know, you know I, it was not about like, get some interesting ideas, like have a sharp take. You really had to, oh, had God, to have look, a certain I craftsmanship. A, I did a couple of stories for the uh, cover stories for the Atlantic uh, in kind of the nineties. Well, eighties, nineties, late eighties, mm-hmm. nineties. One was a, a book ex- excerpt, but one was like on linguistics. And, and because some of these historical linguistics, and because some of these linguists were in Russia, of course they sent me to Russia, uh-huh. right? It's a magazine yeah. piece. Of course you'd send somebody to Russia uh, to talk to several people he could talk to on the phone in principle. Um, and uh, I, I counted up the words, it was 18,000 words. I mean, yeah. I didn't, not exactly, but roughly. It was like, it was like, a, it was like a short book. And well, and I, I, I saw you talking recently, though, you know, because I, I, I feel like you, you had almost the, the soul more of a blogger. 
than a print guy. Uh, and you, I and you, well, you did this piece uh, recently. You you blogged recap recapitulating an older piece you'd done. Um, where you wanted to say, body problem? Yeah, or? and you wanted to say something about consciousness. And it was like, well, the rules of the game at that time where you had to like track down David Chalmers and make him <laughs> make him your like puppet Robert Wright, right? Instead of just like <laughs> saying what you thought. Um, and I saw that because I, I mean, I halfway done with it with a thing and I'm saying, eh, you know, and like David Chalmers says this, blah, blah, blah. And then I have some like, very half-assed summary of of Chalmers and the zombie problem, mm. uh, because like of course I'm not gonna like like go find him and like take right. him out to lunch and be right. like tell me about the hard problem of consciousness. You know, it's right. like I did that class 20 years ago in college. I think I basically remember what he said, um, <laughs> and you know, off we go. Yeah, no different world. Uh, I, but the the amazing thing is. It is since the age, the golden age of blogging, things have changed, it seems to me, at least as much as they changed in between the golden yes. era of like regular journalism, when people mm -hmm. like me, you know, fought their way into this small club of journalists. This is the tragedy of Robert Wright. Can we spend a moment on this, Matt? Yeah. It's like you work for like a decade. Okay, you, you work, you get to, to New Republic. Mike Kinsley's this great editor, and you're and you become like part of this club. It's a small club, you yeah. know. And and, and uh, you're making really decent money, and then all of a sudden the doors get blown open. Anyway, enough enough about the tragedy of my <laughs> my plight. But then after all this, since the the days of blogging, I don't know what I, I would say. Maybe the biggest change has to be kind of social media, right? What do you think? Well, I mean, it's both, right? It's it's social media, and it's also um, Google. Uh, which is not social, right? But it's it's the sort of rise of these big um, tech conglomerates who both dominate the ad sales and also dominate the distribution. And you know, so when when blogs seemed like they were going to be promising, they had a little bit of the quality of print in that the impressions were relatively valuable. You know, and a modest size audience could generate meaningful revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, but Facebook and Google digital ad targeting really served to devalue the web audience. You know, on a on a monetary basis. And so now, to bring in meaningful amounts of money, you need gargantuan traffic. And it's also possible to obtain gargantuan traffic by going viral on Facebook or by being in a Google News kind of box. And that's created a whole new sort of industry structure where every publication, uh, you know, at, at Vox or at Grid that I have some affiliation with now, they have, you know, these um, SEO teams that help people, help writers and editors to understand what keywords people are searching for a lot. And some of that is just so you can optimize your stories, right? So people who are interested in the congressional hearings about the January 6th riots tend to use certain terms to express their interest. And you want to make sure that you use that exact same terminology right. so they can find you. But it also lets you know what people are interested in, right? And I think that's become a problem for people, people like both you and I, I think, who whose preference is to try to write about things um, that are not that we necessarily actually care about. obvious, right? To try to persuade people that something is important that right. you may not think is important. That you know, with a with a blog or with print, you sort of owned the audience, and you could tell the audience, "Okay, this matters," and the audience might disagree with you and decide they don't like your magazine, they don't like your blog. Right. But if you were good at your job of convincing people that things are important, they would keep listening to you yeah. to be like, part of the service that this guy is providing is bringing to my attention things I don't know about. And the modern ad platforms don't work that way. You know, the story could be amazing, but they are feeding people what they have determined people are already interested in and you have to chase that high if you want to get the traffic which is part of the pleasure of something like Substack which brings you back to you know a consistent audience model where they have chosen to give me or you or or Andrew or anyone else the benefit of the doubt 
that the next thing that comes down the pike, you know, will be interesting mm -hmm. uh, because the digital viral web, and that's true whether it's, you know, uh, incumbent brands, New York Times, Washington Post, um, or new startups are completely dependent on this kind of uh, algorithmic audience mumbo jumbo. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, I, I hate to have become a cranky old man, but I, I find it mm -hmm. quite disheartening. <laughs> Yeah, well, the corruption, if you want to call it that, begins early. I remember mm -hmm. when, you know, I was kind of in on the founding of Slate because it was founded by Mike Kinsley, who had been my boss at the uh, at the New Republic. I, I think, you know, like, like the greatest uh, editor of his generation for my money. And uh, I remember him saying, right after Slate had started, he said, do you realize we have statistics for how many people are reading individual pieces? Right. That was a revolution. OK. Right. And, and you know what he said? He said, I think I'm not going to tell the writers what those statistics are right. because it'll have a bad influence. And and that's the beginning. And, 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 and uh, you know, there's a change. Maybe this is an elitist thing to say or to suggest that this that, that, that things were better in olden times. But it used to be before the Internet, the most important kind of feedback you got was in a certain sense through cocktail parties. That is to say, mm -hmm. Mike would have would come in Monday and say, oh, I uh, talked to somebody who loved your piece. Mm -hmm. That was what you wanted. A right. friend of Mike Kinsley's who thought you had done a good job of writing a piece. That's a very different kind of feedback from, you know, you mentioned female body parts and therefore got, you know, eight jillion views. A absolutely. And, you know, and, 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 you know, Kinsley's impulse there that it would degrade the product to give people that audience information, I think was completely correct. Um, but of course, his business instinct, you know, was wrong. And I think the Kinsley era slate was an amazing product. I mean, it was better than the Kinsley era New Republic ever was because he was able to leverage the power of digital technology, but also the financial resources of Bill Gates <laughs> to just like, lose money on a really cool digital publication. And eventually, though, you know, rationalization came for it. And you wound up with something that I think was in a lot of respects worse than the old print products, even though um, technically, like you can do better stuff in digital than, well, than when, you could When did print. it become worse? Now, you worked at Slate, what, around 2000... 2012. Yeah. Um, you know, and when I was working at Slate was, uh, I think, around the bend points on, on digital media sort of really falling apart. I mean, it wasn't just that you, you had the audience metrics, which I, I think is a, is a business necessity, but the nature of what was driving the metrics was really shifting hard. And, you know, there've been in the 10 years since then, a lot of twists and turns in terms of what works on, in SEO, what works on social media. Mm -hmm. But throughout it all, the digital media landscape has been dependent on essentially editorial decisions that are being made in Silicon Valley. Right. You know, that they choose. I mean, I've heard from people who are still working in the, in the viral web that um, in 2022, Facebook has really... Uh, turn down the knob on political content of all kinds, you know, that they have yeah. decided they, they want to step away from that, which, which I think is reasonable actually for everybody involved, but it, it creates a tidal wave across the news environment uh, when something like that happens. And, you know, I mean, I know you have a lot of interest in sort of um, tribalism type, yeah. type phenomena and, you know, that feeds in, I think, in incredible ways to the operation of these kinds of, of digital platforms that you have this very fragmented landscape. You have a lot of targeting of things. Um, there are all these studies that like debunk the idea of filter bubbles. But I think those studies are actually really flawed because what they're capturing is that if you are a progressive, you will be fed actually a very steady diet of right-wing opinion, mm -hmm. but it's the worst of right-wing opinion, right? It's not people saying, oh, here's Raihan Salam right. making a really tough 
good right. point right. that has given me doubt about the direction of progressive governance. It's here is a below average conservative pundit on a bad day doing poor expression of a bad idea. Look at what a racist moron this guy is, right? right? And so you're you're hearing from the other side, but you're not listening to the other side. You're not learning about them. What you're doing is you're being reinforced with the idea that your enemies are all knuckle-dragging morons. But if you think about it for a moment, like there are people who vote for the same political candidates as me, all the time, you know, who I have 95% overlap with, who are morons and scumbags. Um, Would you like to name names? No, I would not. Um, But that's just because, you know, it's a big country, 330 million people, 7 billion people on the planet Earth. There's a lot of morons and scumbags out there. And they're in all factions, right? There's no... There's no political party that is composed exclusively of like intelligent, empathetic people uh, who are doing the right thing Mm. all the time. There just isn't. And so if you want to uh, hold up the idiots and and the racists and the whatever who are are on some other side, like you can always do that. And I think Mm -hmm. that's what we get. And it's not... A filter bubble would be better, honestly. Like just a polite internal conversation among people who share the same values is not totally ideal compared to a a wide ranging diet. But like the worst possible thing is this like nut picking and like, I will find the most insane thing that Jacobin writes on any given day and put it up and be like, man, they're all communists on the left, you know? And in a way, the filter bubble was the old days. I mean, readers of the new Republic didn't read national review by and large. And there wasn't a a mass medium that really had much kind of cerebral conversation. I mean, okay, Mm -hmm. firing line came to be a kind of a thing. But, you know, uh, there were exceptions. But, yeah, I I totally take your point. I mean, part of the problem is the incentive structure on social media. I mean, there's there's more than one source of the dynamic you're talking about. but, But Twitter does reward people for taking the most extreme and craziest takes and behavior on the other side of the tribal divide could just be behavior like, oh, look at this Trump supporter freaking out about having to wear a mask in a supermarket. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, but it but it could also be just a ridiculous take. But but the incentive is so strong. If you look at people who very readily build up big Twitter followings, it seems to me that most of them are doing a version of this at mm-hmm. least some of the time. I mean, probably we all have, but I mean. It seems to me like a pretty rampant problem. No, uh, absolutely. Because it's the, I mean, it's not just that the platform rewards it, but it's that it's the, you know, back to what we were talking about, that in a world of content uh, plenitude, right, the easiest kind of content to generate is like you find someone doing something that is like clearly bad. Mm-hmm. Who your audience has a presupposition to believe that that person is bad. And you just kind of A, B, boom, publish, right? right. Like you, you don't need like an argument. You don't need whatever. Whereas like somebody on your side doing something bad is complicated take. Like what, what am I going to say about that? Right. Or somebody on the other side raising a good point is a complicated... Just both of those would take more work to assemble. It's not that you can't do a good piece or even a piece that will get good traffic that way. Uh, you know, we did a great... Dylan Matthews, when when I was at Vox, when Trump was doing um, his tax bill, you know, he got assigned one day to like really talk to all the smart conservative economists and really explain to people like why did conservative economists think that this incredibly unpopular tax bill was a good idea? Um, and it was a great piece that he wrote and it did good traffic. I mean, it's not that people won't read something like that, but it was very time consuming. Right. Like, Mm. you know, and in the Time Magazine era, that wouldn't have been a problem. Right. It it wasn't that time consuming. (laughs) You know, like he got it done. He didn't need to fly to Russia to talk to Glenn Hubbard on the phone. (laughs) Right. Like it's a totally feasible piece of journalism to execute. And the audience really did like it. I mean, people were interested because you've read all these stories. They're like, like, what are these guys doing? It was a good question. Mm. But the reward is not commensurate to the effort in a universe where you could just post a chart showing, well, it's very skewed to the rich and be like, 
see these assholes, they're doing a tax bill that's skewed to the rich. Uh, and like, it's true that it was skewed to the rich. It's mm-hmm. true that they were assholes. Um, and so like, why not do a story that's accurate, that will be rewarded by your audience, that will be easy to generate, uh, when the alternative is to work much harder on something with at best the same upside. And then maybe if it comes off the wrong way, we'll produce like an outrage mob of cancelers who are like, how dare you right. write something sympathetic to the to the bad guys, right? You have not a lot of upside, a good amount of downside, a lot of extra work. And so, you know, people don't want to do it. Yeah, and I don't think it's just a time issue. I mean, if you're if you're talking about kind of like, I mean, part of the solution is for people like on Twitter or Facebook or whatever to defy the trend we're describing, mm-hmm. to criticize people in their own tribe if they think uh, they deserve it, especially if they think they're guilty of what we're talking about, which is caricaturing uh, the mm-hmm. other side. And, and you know, noting when people on the other side have a good point or or something, you know, that or just saying the truth about what they believe. That do- doesn't just take time. It takes courage. I mean, it takes, it takes, you know, because you're familiar with the kind of blowback you can get. I mean, I oh, remember, sure. I remember like during the, uh, during all the George Floyd protests, it was like, there was this video you probably remember of these outdoor diners in Washington, DC yeah, yeah. and some kind of, you know, uh, some protesters, uh, walk by and demand that the diners show solidarity. It's like, uh-huh. hold up, I forget, hold up your hand or something. Yeah. And if some if some diner didn't do that, they were going to like walk up to them, you know, yeah, in an, and, and in an inherently them, yeah. intimidating way. Anyway, what I remember was like, okay, I obviously consider this a horrible, bad thing. But the environment at that point was such that it's like, geez, am I, uh, am I ready to endure the blowback from my own tribe in some sense? It would take for me uh, yeah, is it worth to condemn it, right? that. And, and I mean, I want to ask you about this issue because you're, uh, I mean, it's funny. It seems to me, this is a tangent that I hope will come back to what we're talking about. I think one key to success in the modern uh, age of journalism, which just pretty much inherently involves social media, is to be willing to be hated. Um, yeah. You got to be willing to be either hated by the other tribe, which is easy. That's not so hard because your your tribe loves you so much for that. Or um, you got to do the more challenging thing in a way, which I think you kind of pull off, which is to be hated within your own tribe in some sense, if you know what I mean. Because I think you right. have tried to resist the pernicious trends I'm talking about. Um, well, I mean, it's a question, you know, there's many more than two tribes out on the internet. Sure. Um, so I actually think that it's not, okay, are you willing to be hated inside your tribe or not? Because there's always, there's like a game beyond the game. But I think that some aspect of our instinctive apparatus is more comfortable with all the hate coming from one direction. Right. Well, yeah, it, it, that if, becomes the other tribe if it persists. Sure. Yes. 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 But it's that. It's that. You know, I think that there like is a tribe in which I operate. Of I don't know what you know, centrist, whatever, whatever. Slow, bo- slow boring people. Yeah. Wh- whatever it is. But what is true is that I, I have an approach in which on any given day, it's not knowable ex ante, like what direction I'm going to be taking some shit from. And that is a little bit more discomforting, I think, to to many people. And, you know, I also think, though, that it's... um, I've moved a little bit off some of these um, kind of psychological, emotional explanations for these things and into an even more elitist take, which is that one problem is that it's just intellectually harder you know, like what I was talking about, like like the tax story, like to talk to the smartest people on the other side of something and listen to them and understand what they are saying and reconstruct their argument in a way that makes sense, even if you don't find it persuasive, is just like actually harder to do mm-hmm. than to just kind of like point and laugh at idiots, right? Like you need to operate in the higher intellectual 
plane where you can then appreciate that like there are smart people on multiple sides of both controversies and you can understand what they're saying and what they're talking about. I and mean, you know, you talk about sort of cognitive empathy, right? And that's part of the same thing though, right? Is to not be like, well, what's the worst reason that, you know, somebody could be doing this? But like, what's what's the best reason? But you need to be pretty smart, I think, to pull that off because you need to be someone who's like capable of engaging with good reasons um, on your own side too, right? And it's it's just like actually challenging and not everyone is up to it. And in a more wide open aperture, there's just like more opportunity for sort of, you know, people who are mediocre at best to take up space. And we always had that. I mean, back in the day, right? I mean, the quality of uh, discourse on television was like not that great, right? And some of that is the TV medium, but some of it is just like who would be on TV and like what is <laughs> rewarded there? You know, you had to be like handsome in a certain level. My voice is much too squeaky to be a 20th century broadcast media professional. Um, you know, it's like an old joke, right? Like a face for radio and a voice yeah. for... I forget well, what it is. Well, blogging um, heads was partly for people with a face for radio. But. No, right. But, you know, but <laughs> but, but, but in that case, I think it opened the door to people who were uh, like smart and had good ideas and interesting conversations and maybe weren't like uh, quite right for traditional television. But in like Twitter, like the joy of it, is that it's like open and everybody can be there and lots of people who, you know, aren't full-time media professionals can like weigh in and often share good ideas, but like also people whose ideas are just terrible and yeah. like incredibly unimpressive are up on there all the time. Well, yeah. And, and, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of reinforcement for them. I mean, you're right. There are a bunch of smart conversations going on on Twitter among people who know what they're talking about and with people they disagree with. It's just that, that's not a ticket to a huge Twitter following, right? I mean, it can be, but uh, it it really um, isn't always. And no. and I'm wondering, do you think there's any hope uh, uh, in like uh, kind of trying to start? I don't know, movement or something, but but like shaming bad Twitter citizens, like making uh, you know behavior that. Uh, you know, is, well, it's just deeply tribal and is making America worse, like considered uncool. I was thinking about in my newsletter, maybe start doing a like bad Twitter citizen of the week. And I, I have some names in mind. I maybe shouldn't mention them. Uh, well, let me- Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's conceivable. You know, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I'm a lot older than I used to be. Huh. And I think that I have a, a, a I think that there- I think that I have obtained some wisdom uh, with age and a more mellow approach and a more mindful approach to certain kinds of things. Um, and I think that that's, you know, good and healthy. And I think pretty typical, you know, of the, of the aging process. Um, but I also think that we as a culture need to promote some of that, some of that aging. I mean, I benefited personally an enormous amount from uh, disruption in the media space. Um, and that's good. Of course, like you can't, you can't have an economy, you can't have a society that doesn't change. But if we can reach a point of some kind of stability in the underlying technology, then we can rebuild a sense of uh, career ladders and dues paying and learning from more mature people about what is considered like appropriate conduct. What would that and, world be like? And how would you create it? <laughs> well, like, I mean, I mean, you know, to an extent, I think it's like, you know, I'm out here now, I'm doing, I'm doing a newsletter instead of a blog, uh, but I have subscribers instead of being for free. And I make money instead of uh, living in a basement. And part of what I do with that money is I like pay other people to work with me, some of whom are young. And I think as in a classical way, like I... I try to like tell them something about my now middle-aged person's, you know, approach to life and journalism. And I think that, um, you know, Millen, my, my current intern and, and Mark Novikov, my, my former one, uh, 
do in fact like display more maturity than I did when I was their age at this point in the industry because they are like coming into something. Um, mm. And that there is, you know, there's hope uh, on some level for different kinds of improvement. And we have real upsides to the opening of the aperture. I mean, we do have a much more diverse media space, um, you know, both in ethnic terms, but also in terms of ideas. There's much less of a, you know, you were talking about like, do my Kingsley's friends at the cocktail party uh, like the piece? And that's a good reward structure in the sense that, you know, Mike's a really smart guy and he's friends with other smart people, but it's also a limited social set, right? And now we have like more cocktail parties and more people you can impress, you know, which is good. Um, But I did think, you know, Jonathan Haidt did this piece recently about social media and and stuff, which I I would quibble with. Yeah, I had I had him on my show. People can can Google that on you, yeah. on YouTube to talk about that. But go ahead. But I mean, he would, he's right that the design of the platforms matters, you know, and it would be really good to convince the decision makers and what are genuinely a very small number of companies. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Google. That's almost it. Uh, to think about the consequences of the decisions that they are making, particularly because the business implications are actually not... It's not obvious to me that that the like money going to Mark Zuckerberg's pocket uh, actually alters all that much. They've changed up how the newsfeed works like a lot over the past 10 years. And I think Facebook has been a successful and profitable enterprise under all those different paradigms. And they actually do have room to think about you know, the impact on society. Yeah, I mean, it's a weird thing. You pointed out recently, I think, or drew my attention to the fact that like, you, if you're running social media, you can convert it into old fashioned, you can just override the algorithm kind of the way TikTok does. I mean, TikTok mm-hmm. is, is a centralized distribution yep. point. Of, they use social feedback to find out what's viral, but then they push it. Yeah. And, and um, it, it's, so, you know, so it's a weird combination, it seems to me, of like, on the one hand, an algorithm that left to its own devices often brings out the worst in us. Uh, and on the other hand, the potential power within very few hands mm-hmm. to take the audience they've gained by running a social media company and doing whatever the hell they want with it. Now, the profit motive constrains them. Assuming they they decide that their goal is not to take over the world, it's just to make money. That's a constraint, but it's I I, I don't I'm not sure uh, which of those I don't know I don't know I don't know where the hope lies exactly. You 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 almost seem more hopeful than 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 I am. Um, well, I'm wh- not like super hopeful. I just don't want to give in to like total. I, I I think that there's a there's a version of pessimism that just relieves people of their responsibility. Yeah. And I don't want to give into that. I, I, I hate it when I hear from Facebook, well, it's not us. We're just reflecting, you know, human behavior. Mm-hmm. Not that they're wrong. I mean, they, the behavior of their platform does reflect human behavior, but they also do have control over how it works. And I think, you know, they have an obligation to... Uh, I don't know what you want to put it, you know, to to God, if nothing else, to mm-hmm. think about what they're doing and pay attention and not just say like, well, we're just holding up a mirror to society. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I love this old um, Wallace Stevens poem, uh, The Man with the Blue Guitar. And people say, uh, you know, play us a song of things exactly as they are. And, and he says, things as they are, are changed on the blue guitar. Um, and, I, and I think that's very true of, of Facebook, right? That it... it it, it 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 holds a mirror up to society, but the design of the mirror is also relevant. Now, do you think? Uh, what do you think of the New York Times these days? Uh, it seems to me uh, some combination of social media and and you know advertising incentives as mediated by social media and search optimization and uh, and the Trump era have, yeah. have changed it pretty dramatically and I, 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 to me it seems like it departs more from the journalistic ideal which of course was never realized but the journalistic ideal of objectivity do you think that's crazy yeah i mean i used to be i'm like an opinion guy and i yeah. used to be very critical of the like 
news opinion divide concept. I thought it was philosophically unsound and sociologically unrealistic, and that it created a kind of unwarranted disrespect, actually, for sort of like columnists and and people who had takes and things like that. As I've seen that play out, the erosion of that divide, um, I think I was wrong and that I mistook the kind of direction that that change would take. And then what you now have is a lot of people doing opinion work, um, but who aren't good at it, who don't state clear theses, who don't provide real evidence and logical argumentation for their theses, but who actually maintain the formal structure of a news article, but lose the uh, discipline of objectivity and balance mm-hmm. to just present very sl- to deliberately present slanted takes on the world uh, because like it is true that the formal properties of the objective news article never guaranteed like accuracy or balance or fairness right. but instead of saying well that's like a problem that we have to try to address in our daily practice it's become like well that's a loophole that we're just allowed to exploit Right, that if it has an inverted pyramid format, uh, it's okay. It's news, right? Or if we call it analysis, um, and it's it's quite. Uh, I, I think it's bad. It's a bad trend for society. Um, and I say that not because I'm like a super duper hard news junkie, exactly, but because I think opinionated work needs to be done appropriately. Where you say, like, here's what I think, here's why I think it, mm-hmm. here is what I think is a reasonable counter argument, but here's why I think that that counter argument is wrong. I mean, I, I could teach some, I could teach like a class to very earnest students, mm-hmm. on like how to do an opinion column correctly. Right. But that's like not what I think is showing up. Um, in okay, the, but, but in to the be papers. clear, there are two issues. There, there's yeah. the issue of the New York Times purportedly repertorial, purportedly objective repertorial stuff. And then there's its its opinion stuff, which is a fairly large volume. Do you have issues with both? Um, no, I mean, I, I think I think it's the the sneaking of opinionated stuff into the news pages has produced what's in effect like a low volume. That low quality opinion, which, you know, if I look at the New York Times opinion section, it is um, skewed ideologically relative to like the United States of America as a whole or like me personally. But I think the average quality of the columns like is quite high. Mm-hmm. Um, they are good columnists. And I just if I was in charge, I might add some different people or something like that. But they, but they do, I think, basically good work. And I think their news reporters do good news. I mean, I, I can't think of a better source of news information. Yeah. But they do now put out a lot of stuff that kind of muddies the waters uh, between those bridges. I read a column for um, Bloomberg Opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Bloomberg... Which is kind of amazing. I just have to pause yeah. and marvel at your productivity. I, I honestly don't get it. Like, yeah. I, I mean, are you, uh, can I just ask you about that? I mean, do you not have like normal human emotions and distractions or what? I think I have a lot of, I just write quickly, you know? Okay. Go I don't ahead. know. Sorry, uh, interrupting. Oh, yeah. Well, just so, so, I mean, Bloomberg is a place that goes really hard on the old school, you know, kind of divide, right? There's like mm-hmm. all this news. And the point of the news right. is that like you, a bond trader, just <laughs> literally want to know what happened. And then the point of the opinion is that Michael Bloomberg, the sugar daddy behind it all, thinks your takes are smart and wants to publish them, right? And like, there's no, they, they don't meet, like there's a huge like opinion thing. You're supposed to say like, you know, in my bio line, I'm a columnist for Bloomberg opinion, right? Uh-huh. Like it's like a different thing. Um, it's got different editors, you know, like a whole different agenda. And I think that there's something healthy about that. Yeah. Right, that like the news reporters are not expected to make a splash in the way that an opinion writer might. Right, right. It, 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 it actually well, like it. It puts an undue pressure on you if like you're not only supposed to accurately report what happened at the Fed meeting, but like also like make it sexy. Right, right, and like, but but the Bloomberg business model is that their subscribers like actually care. Yeah, like but, what the 
factual information is. And so the job of the reporters is to serve the audience, like not to serve the audience's like psychic needs, but to serve their like actual requirement to have solid information. And most of us aren't like that. You know, we like are curious about the Chase of Budin recall in San Francisco, but like it has nothing to do with our lives. Right. We don't lose money if we get inaccurate information. Right. And so you're totally free to develop whatever take you want on, you know, uh, the ups and downs of Brexit or, or anything yeah. else, uh, because it's all just cheap talk. And, and the business press has the, the discipline that like being wrong could cost you money. Yeah. I mean, I should say what I'm saying about the Times, I would apply to a number of other places, Washington Post and and to some extent, Wall Street Journal and so on. It, it's a generic, uh, you know, incentive kind of issue. It, it, this reminds me of, uh, just, just quickly of, of another thing that's changed since uh, I got into journalism, which is uh, journalists are now often responsible, not just for the writing, but for the promotion of it. OK, it used to be like you wrote your piece for the New Republic, Miller Time. Uh, the, the the magazine job was to promote it, period. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they might ask you to go on some radio show or something, but but, but you didn't have to take any initiative. And I, I, I think the reliance on journalists to promote their work has uh, created a niche for a different kind of journalist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I used to think the ideal journalist was almost, uh, I wouldn't say quite antisocial, but, uh, you know, kind of indifferent uh, or less responsive to a lot of standard social incentives, and for that reason, capable of doing a kind of uh, objective reporting, or or maybe I should say to maintain a healthy cynicism about the whole system and a healthy skepticism about the whole system, or something. I don't know, but this is this is a change, and I and I think uh, I think it matters, and and, so, and of course, some outlets are now saying, well, we we think maybe we don't want our reporters on Twitter so much, and that'll. Yeah. That'll have both pros and cons for them. I mean, I I worry about that almost more in terms of its impact on academia. Huh. You know, where like now, you know, just like one way to become a big deal as a professor. Who's this philosopher at Yale or something on Twitter? Jason Stanley, yeah. What the hell is that? I don't know. I've only seen a few tweets. I shouldn't judge, but it it's this is not your father's uh, philosophy professor. Anyway. Yeah, and I mean, but that's just sort of the case. You know, you can tell that like which epidemiologists get quoted a lot in the news yeah. is in part a function of which of them have large Twitter followings rather than the like exact relevance of their expertise or or something else like that. And of course, it's natural. I mean, as a person who writes a lot of stuff. It's like when you're responsible for writing at high volume, you have a lot of, you know, availability heuristic. And, you know, it's always been the case in journalism that, you know, you call up somebody, you know, an expert to be in your article, but you want to know what they're going to say. I mean, you're calling them because you you need to get what they, they, they want. But also to assemble your reporting, your schedule, mm-hmm. you like need a sense in advance of where the different people stand, mm-hmm. right? So by being on Twitter a lot, there people can know what kind of perspective you're going to offer. It makes you a good resource. You're accessible. Uh, but it starts to create a, you know, a, a distorted view of the expert community. And, you know, you talk about journalists, people, but it's like, I really think of like the, <laughs> the classic professor model as like a, like a true weirdo. You know, like yeah, somebody, yeah, yeah. So, somebody oh, like yeah, off yeah. publishing weird yeah. stuff, right? And then like some journalist might find you and be like, hey man, what's up with whatever. Uh, yeah. But now it's this gregariousness and like being exactly. a public personality and taking sides in feisty political debates. Right. And like my paper, you know, my like regression analysis proves that. I, I saw one thing where it was like, someone was trying to show that... um uh, there's a strong correlation between the racial resentment index and opposition to abortion rights. Um, and, you know, somebody was like putting their, putting their chart uh, with the fantails off. And of course, that's a good, people eat that up like catnip. Um, mm-hmm. Like literally the same regression also showed that being African-American was correlated with being pro-life. 
which right. was, was not as viral a take. And so the professor, the author of this research, which I think was fine research when you like dug into what it said, but like was put in a very particular spin on her paper for the purposes of making it, uh, totally. you know, viral. Well, right? I, 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 and that's, that's just like not how you would have done <laughs> academic work agenda. No, it's it's kind of the equivalent of, of getting your feedback from Mike Kinsley's friends at the cocktail party. That's mm -hmm. where academics used to get their feedback from peers almost exclusively. And yep. that's a that's a very different world. Now you have, as they say in the business, a hard out in yeah. two in two minutes. Is that right? I so do. quickly let me say uh, something about newsletters. Uh, I want to finish with yours. I'll start with mine. It's called non-zero as apparently is everything I'm associated with now. Uh, and um I just want to say, I address a lot of these issues in that. I think one difference between me and you, I mean, you were saying this is a problem of like having enough time to do good journalism. I, I, I and, and just, and I think the reason for you, it's mainly a time problem, even though ironically, you seem unconstrained by time in terms of your productivity, is I, I actually think you naturally transcend, relatively speaking, compared to the average person, uh, some, some things that afflict, uh, you know, the, the kind of psychology of tribalism. I think Many of us have more trouble, and that's uh, partly what uh, what I talk about in the newsletter. But anyway, as for um, your uh, newsletter, now slow boring, I, I gather, is not a description of the newsletter. It's something somebody once said about the working of government, about the making of good policy or something. It's Max Weber says that politics okay. is strong and slow and steady boring of hard boards. Um, and I am trying to counsel a little bit more patience, a little bit more deliberation. I mm -hmm. think uh, similar to you, I think uh, try to encourage a little bit more mindfulness um, mm -hmm. among people. Uh, you know, and I should say, I mean, uh, before Non-Zero was a newsletter, uh, it was a book that you wrote uh, quite a while ago that I read when I was in high school, I think. Um, oh, God. And I loved. And it made an incredible impression on me. And I think that the insight that there are aspects of the political domain that are this kind of zero-sum competition for status and power, uh, but that then the important policy-making domain is not zero-sum, is fundamental. And, and it's just like a view that is missing from a lot of commentary, that like there's this flip, right? There's a constant tension between the zero sum and the non-zero aspects of political debate and political controversy. And that we are always better off when we can focus on the non-zero elements and on making them positive sum and get out of the, the zero sum conflict world. Uh, but which is, it's very real and present, you know, like only right. one person can be president. Um, and both of them, right? Like including the one who we agree with more are playing a zero sum game for themselves while we are living as citizens in a non-zero world. And you need to have some, uh, a mix of skepticism to your own side and openness to the other to see the difference between those frames and to find those opportunities. I couldn't have said it better myself or even as well, probably. Uh, so thanks for that closing riff and thanks for all your work, you're doing God's work in my view uh, and people should follow you on Twitter, read your newsletter and so on. So thanks, right. Matt. Thank you.